Thank you, Carmelo. A very good job. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and fight, findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. The kids are going to go practice right now for our Christmas play. I know you're thinking this. It's not even October yet. How in the world are we getting ready for Christmas? Christmas is just a few months away. And, and if you haven't gone on Amazon and gotten your uh, Christmas presents yet, uh, it's okay. It's all right. I'm sure Black Friday and Cyber Monday will help you. How many of you have found out that this, these, uh, these new Black Fridays and Cyber Mondays, they don't really help you save money? Uh, you notice that? They haven't helped you. What, what have they helped you do? Create clutter. Create clutter in your garage. You know, my garage was, is noted for, well, used to be noted for one thing and one thing only, stuff. It's where I put everything. Anybody else can relate to that? That's where everything goes. Every year, I, I determine uh, in January to clean out uh, my garage, and I would put it off until spring, and then spring come, and I'd clean it out. And every year, same thing. I clean it out. I'd sweep it out. Uh, I, I'd put everything back in an orderly fashion, and everything looked great. I took, I, I wish I would have put it up here, but I took before and after pictures of my garage one year, and man, I sent it to my family. They're like, whoa, that's amazing. Can you come do mine? And, and I thought, no, that was just tiring. I don't want to do anybody else's because that's that was just a lot of clutter that I'd take out and I'd rearrange. Well, I'd come back in a week. And you know what I'd find in that garage? A war zone. Everything's everywhere. I'd find a path maybe to the favorite uh, toolbox that I would gather uh, stuff from to work on stuff or the, uh, uh, the stuff that I need for the lawn. And it was just a war zone. Every year, clutter would just come and damage everything. How many of you have tried cleaning your house only to find that it didn't make a lasting impact? Right? Yeah. Today we're going to learn from this text about cleaning our house. You're like, but I didn't come to church to clean, think about my house. Jesus uses this analogy to talk about a man's life, a man's heart, the spiritual realm. And he's giving us this illustration to help us to make room for what lasts. We as individuals, as people, we have a, a, a life that desires change. And, and often it, we try to clean up our lives and it just doesn't last. Uh, uh, maybe you're like me and every once in a while you're like, I don't like the way uh, this clutter makes me feel. Or, or maybe you are trying to drive something wicked out of your life and you know that uh, it, maybe you have a pleasure in sin for a season, but afterwards it just, just tears you apart and you're done with it. And you say, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to clean up my life. Uh, maybe you don't like feeling angry all the time and, and you make that uh, concentrated effort to change only to find out in months later that you're the same and sometimes worse. We remove habit after habit. We remove people from our lives. We remove demons and we start sweeping out the dirt of the in evil influence uh, that, that, that just we know is bad for us only to come back to the same spot and, and be even more depressed because it's the same thing over and over again. As Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees, he's using this illustration uh, uh, to help them understand that removing evil influences from your life, cleaning up your life, is not enough. It's not enough. You need to fill it with purpose. The follower of Jesus Christ here this morning, you need to fill it with Jesus. And we have a uh, God who has now given us this illustration and this help uh, 
to give us this mindset, this picture, this beautiful picture of somebody who has driven the evil demon out of his life and he swept up the, uh, uh, the floor. He's rearranged and replaced furniture. And all of a sudden, it seems like he's sitting back in his recliner, watching football, eating Cheetos. And uh, uh, as soon as he figures out that uh, life isn't just about relaxing, he turns around and that evil spirit has come back with more uh, uh, evil spirits that are worse than him. And, And Jesus is telling us that if we don't fill our life with purpose, with Jesus, we, our end is going to be worse than our beginning. And as we look at this, I want us to see that Jesus is helping us understand that there is a danger in having an empty house. There's a danger in having an empty house. Now, I'm not talking about empty nest syndrome, and I, 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 I know I got young kids. I don't know. I thought about this as preparing for this message. I thought about this. If my kids were not in my house, how would I, how would that make me feel? I, I think I would feel a little bit empty. I, I mean, I got my wife and, and we're best friends and we would talk and we'd do things, but, but my kids are young and, and they're energetic and, and, and you know, you all know Annie, Cassie and Emma, they just uh, are, a, they're so much fun. They're such good kids. And, and, and without them, we, we, we probably would kind of be bored, right? How many of you empty nesters can maybe relate to what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling? I'm not even there yet. Some of you uh, are like my parents. My parents said, that's it. when you turn 18, that's it, you're out. I don't care if you got a job or not, you're out of my house. I want my house to myself. And uh, that's what my dad and mom said, just get out of here. Quit bothering me. Quit using up all my money. And, uh, uh, and, then, we had, and then we had kids and they're like, come back, come back. Come back to my house, and we want to see you again. No, you don't want to see me, Mom. You don't want to see me, Dad. You want to see my kids. So we'll send them, and then we'll have an empty nest for a little bit. And then when my kids come back, guess what happens? My, my kids left perfect. They came back spoiled. They came back spoiled. Grandparents, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you, you do it on purpose. I don't know why. You, maybe your parents did it to you, and now you feel you have to reciprocate that to your kids. That's, you need to break the cycle. You need to break it right there. No, 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 no. Can't do it. I can't wait to be a grandparent so I can spoil my kids and send them back home. That's going to be great. But right now in your life, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to fill your life with Jesus or let it be filled with the world. Let it be filled with evil. Let it be filled with things that seem okay but, uh, uh, but are kind of out of control And you have a choice and an opportunity to live with a house full of purpose or a house full of chaos. The danger of an empty house is that it is going to be filled with something. And Jesus is telling the Pharisees that you need to make sure that you're filling it with purpose. God is telling us that we need to be filled with purpose. Some of us are living with empty houses, empty hearts. Uh, We think we're doing better because the bad stuff's gone. But if we're not careful, it will just come back in full force. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've emptied your life of bad before. You try to quit this bad habit. You turned a new leaf only to find out a month after January it's back and the depression is worse. Jesus is giving us help. He's saying, fill it. Uh, Actor Philip Seymour Hoffman, I got a picture of him thanks to, um, I think it's Slate.com. How many of you recognize him? He was a famous actor. One of my favorite films that he played in was called Twister. Twister. Some of you are looking at me like, Twister, what's that, Pastor? I have no idea what that is. It was an awesome show. It was great, especially when you watched it on TV and all the curse words were edited out of it back in the 90s. That was awesome. Uh, He played in that. He played in several different things, but what many people didn't know about his life is that he struggled with addiction. After the film Twisters, he got sober, and he was sober for 23 years. 23 years. He got his life back in order, and he became quite a famous actor playing in different movies such as Mission Impossible. I think it was Mission Impossible 2, and uh, and many of you might know him from those 
those movies, The Hunger Games, the last two uh, of those series, and and he played a good good guy, and uh, uh, it, it was kind of interesting. His acting style was different. He became very notable. But in the making of uh, uh, Hunger Games, and by the way, I haven't watched them, so don't tell me how they go. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, Hunger Games, in the filming of the last Hunger Games, he, he relapsed after 23 years. He relapsed. And like most people who suffer with an addiction and they don't fill it uh, after they get rid of it with something purposeful, uh, he relapsed, and the relapse caused uh, an overdose, and he died unexpectedly. He was a noted actor. He was uh, a, a critically acclaimed actor who many people loved working with. He earned an Oscar and multiple accolades, but despite his sobriety and his career success, he relapsed because he didn't fill the emptiness with what was good and purposeful. And if we're not careful, we can go about the same path. You say, well, I got Jesus. That's fine. We live in a society in a day and age where if we're not careful, those who come to church are trying to fill their lives with activity and not Jesus. Those who come to church activities are trying to fill it with people. And, and they think they can get satisfied and uh, they can become fulfilled by interacting with individuals. And, and while that's fun and it's part of the Christian life, it is not the thing that will fulfill you. We live in a society that just recently we have had several pastors of evangelical churches and several great men who have fallen because instead of focusing on who can truly fill you, they focused on the work. And we've fallen. The Pharisees who, and scribes whom Jesus is uh, referring to in this text, he's, he's telling them that, uh, that you, have, you have followed some principles that are good and you've emptied yourself of some evil, but you have not filled it with what is necessary. The danger of an empty house. Friends, can I say this this morning? Oh, I don't care if you want me to or not, I'm going to. Friends, you are in danger of falling to something worse if you do not fill your life with what Jesus designed you to be filled with. And we need to be so careful and we need to be so purposeful in filling it with what God has told us to fill it with so that everything else that seems attractive, everything else that seems uh, pleasurable for a season but yet will end in depravity and, and horror, we need, to, uh, we need to intentionally identify those things and root them out of our lives and fill it with what God has told us will fulfill us. Because I don't want your end to be worse than your beginning. How many of you have people who have gotten saved in your life and they've been baptized and they were on, they, it seemed like they were on fire for years in your, the church you attend in Faithway, only to find out a couple years later that their life just ended in shambles. Anybody else? I, I know we're Baptists and if you raise your hand, you might tear a rotator cuff, but raise your hand if you know that, yeah, right? We know those people. I know those people. How many of family members you thought, man, they're on it. They, they got it. Only to find out that the, the skeletons in their closet came to light and they just vanished away. Their end was worse than their beginning. It's because they didn't heed the warning of the danger of an empty house. We need to make sure that we're following after Jesus. By the way, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 says this, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, and the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. He's talking to people who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. He's talking to people who have rooted out adultery, rooted out idolatry, rooted out fornication, rooted out lying, rooted out all kinds of anger and bitterness, only to come to the place where they did not mean to be. A place of ruin. How many of you know that we are all in danger of standing in the same place of ruin that many have stood in before. Without recognizing that reality, 
we cannot hope to be filled with Jesus. Jesus tells them that we have a problem. We need to decide to remove the wicked influences of our lives, yes, and we need to now uh, understand what the next part and the next steps are to be filled with our life. And I want to see the power of filling your life with God. In our text today, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says in verse 44 that there is a power in filling our lives with something uh, other than just being uh, being a model for the Christian faith. Look at what he says, uh, verse 44. Then he saith, I will return. This is the wicked spirit that saith it. He says, I will return to my house from whence I came. And, uh, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. The enemy is always looking. The enemy is always looking to come back and to destroy what he left. He's his warring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for that. And by the way, uh, uh, we need to make sure that we're just not the model houses like we see in some of these areas. How many of you go, I love doing this. I haven't done it in years, but I love going to the model houses in the new development areas. I love doing that. Why, do, how many of you like that? Okay, it's not just ladies, right, guys? We like it too. Uh, I'll tell you where I like to go, the garage. Why? Because it's empty. It's beautiful. It looks great. And I imagine what I would put in that garage. My weight sets over here and, 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 and the car can fit here and then the treadmill's here and then Heather's stuff over here somewhere. And, um, and I just imagine where all that stuff would go. Heather's, Heather and the, uh, the kids are running through the area. My kids like the kitchen. They like pulling down that, uh, that washing machine or the dryer, uh, not the dryer, the, the dishwasher. And they like pulling out the racks and making all kinds of noise. They like, they like playing around in those things, like playing house. And and uh, when I asked, hey, can we, do you think we should buy this? They're like, yes, yes. And I said, sorry, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough. It's empty. The places that get abused the most in those areas are not the houses that are filled with people. It's the houses that don't have anybody in them. The places that have to have the homeless driven out of the most are the places that are vacant. Vacant. Because they're looking for shelter. The, the evil spirit was driven out, and yet uh, he, was, he searched the dry lands for some, some respite. He searched the area for some place to, uh, to stay, and he couldn't find anything. And then he thought to himself, hey, I know where to go. I'll go back to the place I just got cast out of, because maybe, maybe he's just uh, uh, satisfied with, uh, with the cleaning that he's done. And maybe he's, just, uh, uh, he's ready to give me another cold drink, and maybe he's ready for me to entertain him a little bit more like we used to. And he comes and he finds it empty and he sees you sitting on the recliner eating Cheetos. And he says, perfect. I like Cheetos. Hey, you're watching the game? All right. I don't know what the Packers are doing right now. I'm hoping they're winning. But you're watching the Packers game? All right. Okay, all right, here I am. I'm going to come. And I'm going to sit with you. And then he, what, he doesn't just stay. He goes and finds more. Not just more. He finds spirits that are worse. When we get rid of an addiction in our life, and we relapse, we don't always go back to the same thing. Sometimes we go back to the same thing and more and worse. Binging. We have this problem as humans. It's called the sin curse. We have a natural uh, a bent towards rebellion towards God. And we try to fill our hearts with things that feel good but not everything that feels good is good for you. And Jesus is saying we need to fill our lives with something that is purposeful. And here's where the power of filling your life with God is in play. We can't just clean up our life. We need to fill it with God's word. We need to fill it with prayer. We need to fill it with community. We need to fill it with purpose. It's not enough just to come to church. It's not enough just to pray. It's not enough just to read your word. It's not enough just to think, play like you belong in the Christian life. You have to, with a heart full of love for Jesus, let him fill you and let that life be shown to everyone around you. You need to be actively and intentionally walking with God. The people who make the biggest difference in the Bible 
Let's look at Paul, for instance. Paul, the apostle whose name was Saul before he got saved, he had purpose in his life before he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. He thought he was working for God, and he was putting people of a weird cult in prison. He thought he was doing God a justice. He was taking these people, which they called the people of the way. And he rounded them up and he put them in prison. He brought them before the courts of the religious system of the Jews of that day. And he accused them of heresy. And they threw him in prison many times to death. And he thought he was cleaning up Israel. He got, he got a letter from the, uh, the chief priest. He got a letter from the chief priest with authority to go to Damascus to round up people of the way and put them in prison and many times putting them to death. And he went on the way to, the, uh, to Damascus uh, to do that very thing with a heart full of zeal, thinking, I am doing something for God. I have purpose. I know the word and I know I'm doing what's right. But if he was honest with himself, he would understand the old te- that the Old Testament was condemning the very thing he was doing. That God, even in the Old Testament, was condemning his barbaric way of thinking. And Jesus decided to step in. And he met him in the way. A light shone around him and he said, Paul, or Saul, Saul, uh, 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 why why kickest thou against the pricks? Uh, Why persecutest thou me? And, And Saul said, who are you? I don't know who you are. Who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. And that day he left a changed man. And uh, you can read the rest of the story. And uh, three years later, he came, comes back into the scene and, and calls his name Paul. And instead of being filled with a zeal to punish people who are different, who re- believe in a different way, he is now part of that way which we call Christianity today. And he filled his life with purpose and being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, he went out, God called him as a missionary, and he went out around the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which he once persecuted. He was miserable before. Now, even in turmoil, he is rejoicing in the fact that he can suffer with his Savior. Paul, what a great testimony. He stopped hurting people and started helping people. If you want to fill your life with Jesus, I got to warn you that you're going to be somebody who helps others fill their lives with Jesus. Hey, if you want to really get rid of, uh, use that space for productivity, use it for Jesus. Your heart is the house that, the, that Jesus is illustrating here. Your heart is something that, that God has designed for a purpose. By the way, God didn't design you on accident. God didn't make you, uh, 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 make you somebody who's just, gonna, just meant to sit there and do nothing. He meant you to glorify Him. He designs you with a purpose, and He wants to fill you with the ability to, to, to complete that purpose, but you cannot do it on your own. You have to do it with Him. So I need to, uh, let's, uh, I don't know, Faithway, let's look at this this morning. Let's understand that he created you not just to dwell in your house. He created you to fill your house with purpose so that you could be busy doing good while others dwell on the bad. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him in baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of God life. Oh man, can I tell you that I've never had more fun than when I not walk in newness of life. I'll be, I'll warn you though, I've never had a a more real compassion and sorrow for others than when I walk in newness of life. I I don't want to leave you with a false hope thinking that every day of your life is going to be filled with uh, like this ecstasy. It's, it's not always going to be filled with this ecstasy. It's going to be filled with sorrow. The Bible tells us to weep with those that weep. We're going to have a real compassion for people. I got to warn you, if you want to make a difference in this world, you're going to have to have some compassion. You're going to have to care. You're going to have to make sure that your heart is bent towards what God cares for. And you're going to hurt. You're going to hurt. But I tell you, the end of that hurt is going to be something far greater than the sorrow you will feel 
being filled with the wicked devices of the world. I have been lost and partied and had a great time. Yeah, I had fun being unsaved. How many else can understand what I'm saying? I had fun as an unsaved individual, but that fun lasted for like a night. And the next day I had to call a bunch of people and tell them I'm sorry just so that I can come back to work and not be fired. Now when I'm now that I'm saved, God convicts my heart of doing something stupid. That's in the Greek here somewhere. Stupid. And I get right with God and I get right with the people. And can I tell you the, the time of worship and praise with Jesus, the time of intimacy with God and the people of God is far greater than the temporary pleasure I had partying with the world. By the way, I don't think we should cut out partying. Oh, I know, Pat, you're saying, Pastor, come on. I'm not talking about drinking. I'm not talking about the party of the world. We need to have some Christian partying. We need a fellowship with one another. Our community groups are part of our Christian partying, okay? Uh, we're coming together. And by the way, this Christian partying, you'll never have to say, I'm sorry for. This Christian partying, you'll never wake up with a hangover. The Christian party, you'll never have to worry about calling and saying, I'm sorry for not being in control of my facets, my faculties. I, I, am, uh, I am completely convinced that when we party as Christians in the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the world will know that we have more fun. We have more fun. I love it. We need to make sure that we're walking. So we need to make sure uh, that we're filled with the Spirit of God, walking in newness of life. Uh, Corinthians says this. He says, "For uh, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Can I tell you, he's saying, have community. That's a catchword in our society, so I'm using it, all right? Have community. Have community within the body of Christ. If you don't have a best friend right here in this congregation, make one. Make one. If you know somebody that needs to be a part of this community, invite them to this community. But be intentional about being a part of the body of Christ. Can I tell you, Christ's body does not operate... Uh, 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 <sighs> It doesn't operate, it doesn't have out-of-body experiences. Christ's body does not have out-of-body experiences. The local church is the place we need a fellowship. The local church is the place we need to come together and say, God, you started this covenant uh, in your son's blood, and I am going to obey this covenant. I'm going to walk in your promise. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to sorrow with those who are sorrowful, and I'm going to rejoice with those who rejoice. And I'm going to be committed to you, Lord, here in this local church, the body of Christ. And, and uh, the body of Christ may be paralyzed for a moment, but we need that reviving of the Holy Spirit of God to help us to be unified and used in uh, his purpose. Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know the love of Christ with passive knowledge, that you might be filled with all fullness of God. What is your purpose as a follower of Jesus Christ? It's to be filled with all fullness of God. I, can, I, I will dare, dare say this. You were created, even if you don't know Jesus as your, as your Savior, you were created to be filled with the fullness of God. He created you on purpose. And if you're not pursuing that, then you are missing out and you have a danger of being filled with that which is wicked. Let me define wicked for a moment. There's two types of wicked in the Bible or evil in the Bible. There's evil meaning calamities. You know what I'm talking about? Things that happen to people that are out of their control. Calamities. The Bible says God uses that for his glory. He, help, he uses those things. He uses everything to bring glory to him. But calamities are something he uses to help us understand we're so small. Our power is limited. He is unlimited. Then there's the wicked or the evil of the Bible that means rebellion against God. We could either be filled with rebellion against God or God. Jesus is warning us that as 
followers of Christ, we could still either be filled with rebellion towards God or God. And he's saying the choice is yours. The choice is yours. And if you're filled with rebellion towards God, the, the end of that is worse than your beginning. But if you're filled with the fullness of God, the end of that is far greater than your beginning. We can choose today. By the way, we need to make sure that we are filled with the fullness of God and then partaking in what God told us. Carmelo, I'm so glad you read that next passage. We're going to preach on this the next Sunday. Uh, that, that next portion of Scripture is talking about Jesus' family. And a lot of people don't understand the connection uh, within the context of Matthew 12, the end part of it, because it seems like he's just going off the rails. It just seems like he's just bringing stuff up on accident like this one. How, how, what is he talking about, a, a man driving out an evil spirit? He was just talking about something else. A minute ago, he was talking about, what is he talking about here in Matthew chapter uh, 12? He was talking about the sign of Jonas, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and now he's talking about an evil spirit. What's going on here? But it's all connected. The, without the resurrection, you cannot be filled with the Spirit of God. Without the resurrection, you cannot have newness of life. Without the resurrection, you will have your end worse than your beginning. It's all connected. And if you per, uh, put your faith in the, resurrect, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you have an opportunity to be part of the family of God. And if you refuse to be part of the family of God, I want you to see what Jesus says here in our text. He says in verse, uh, or in the next text, he says this in verse 47. He says, Then one told him, uh, Behold, thy mother and thy brother standeth without, desiring to see, speak with thee. Verse 48 says, But he answered and said unto him, and told him, Who is my mother? Who is my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand and said uh, uh, toward his disciples, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of uh, my Father, which is in heaven, the same shall be my brother and sister and mother. Can I tell you what he's saying? He's saying, if you don't do the will of my Father, you can't be. You can't be. To be part of the family of God, you need to do the will of him that sent him. Who is the will of him that sent him? Acknowledge your sin. Believe on Jesus Christ. And partake in the family. Be part of the body. How do you fill it with purpose? You fill it with Jesus. You identify the wicked and you trust in God's plan for your life. Jesus redefines the family as those who are filled with God's will. Oh, man. I can't wait. All right. My, I started this whole sermon with my garage. My garage, I'd clean it out. A week later, it'd be messy. Sometimes even more quicker than that. So I clean it out. And then a day later, my kids' bikes are here when I told them specifically to put them here. My stuff's over here when I thought it was over here. I'd fix a car, my car, and then just stuff everywhere, right? It used to be known for a disaster zone until my wife kicked me out of my workout room. She took over my office. She looked at my office and she said, it's a mess in here. I'm kicking the, I'm taking your weight set out. I'm taking your desk out. I'm taking your bookshelves out. And, and I had nowhere to work out. So where did it go? The garage. Everything went to the garage. Eric, you know what I'm talking about. Everything went to the garage. And then I really wanted to get in shape. So what did I do? I organized the garage as my workout space. I use it every day. I filled it with purpose. And can I tell you, that garage no longer gets messy. Oh, it has messy corners. It has some different un unorganized spots. But I, when I'm working out, I make sure that floor is swept. I make sure the weights are racked. I make sure everything is in its place. Why? Because I'm going to use it tomorrow. I'm going to use it tomorrow. In our lives, you can clean out your, 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 the space of your, your life that needs to be cleaned out, and then you go use another space. And you forget about it. And then it gets cluttered. And then we say, what happened? We didn't fill it with purpose. You need to fill your space with purpose. Jesus tells us that if we don't, it will be worse than when we started. 
When you fill your life with purpose, your, your life becomes usable for God's glory. It becomes usable for the family of God. It becomes a blessing to those who don't know Jesus. Fill it with purpose. Lastly today, I want to give you three steps. I'm not a big fan of three steps to, to, to success and all that, but I want to give us three steps, biblical steps, that will help us fill our life with what matters. Three steps. This is in our in your notes today, so you don't really have to uh, do it, but think about these steps, these three steps. The first step is fill your mind with God's Word. Fill your mind with God's Word. When you fill your mind with God's Word, you read Scripture daily. It's, it's not just enough to sweep it clean. It's, you got you to gotta fill it with truth. All right, here's, here's the big difference between New Year's resolution and Christ changing your life. Here's the big difference. You don't have the power to fulfill your life with purpose, but Jesus, Jesus doesn't just clean you with his blood. He fills you with his spirit. And he uses it supernaturally to help. How do we know what God wants us to do if we don't know what he has said? Fill your life with purpose, with truth. Uh, Psalm 119, uh, verse 11. How many of you know this passage? How many of you know this passage? If you don't, listen to it. Let's say it together. Ready? Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It says, thy word have I hid. I treasured it. I treasured it. And, and earlier in our text, we learned that when we, when we put stuff in our treasure, the, out of the treasure of a man's heart, the mouth speaketh. We've learned that, right? And that treasure is a storehouse. I put it in my storehouse. Why? For use. We could either be like Scrooge McDuck. How many of you know Scrooge McDuck? Love Scrooge McDuck. I wish I had his money. I would use it a lot differently than he did. But uh, he would swim in his money. You remember that guy? We can use it like Scrooge McDuck who knew by, by feeling. If somebody was touching his money, his feathers went up in a floral, right? He knew what was going on. If somebody came in to steal his lucky dime, he felt it. And he said, put it back. Scrooge McDuck. We can be a Scrooge McDuck with God's blessings or... Or we could be Jesus. We can give it freely. He's given you all of his riches and glory. He's given you a place in, high, in, in heaven. He's given you a place of authority alongside him. He's given you his righteousness. And we could either treasure that so it could be used. Or we could treasure it like the man who put the, uh, the money in a napkin and hid it in the ground. One says, one will get you well done, thou good and faithful servant. The other will say, you wicked, you wicked man. What do you want? I don't know. How many of you want to hear from God, you terrible person? I don't. Can you imagine hearing that from God? I'm already at his feet with my head down. I'd be crying. I can't imagine hearing you misused what I gave you to use. He's telling us, that we can harbor his, heart, his word in our heart so that others might be benefited, that we might not have sin against God. Then secondly, you need to fill your time with God's purpose. Fill your time with God's purpose. We could either be like the man sitting back on the lazy boy binge watching net, uh, our favorite Netflix or Prime show, or we could take the time to do what God values. We can love our family. We can love the church. We can work for God together. We can do something in our community that helps people understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can make a difference. You can do things that God values. Then lastly, you should fill your relationships with godly influence. Can I, can I help us here today? There are people who claim to love God, that want to influence you in ways that do not honor God. We need to fill our life with people who are godly influenced. Can I, that doesn't mean they're perfect. Please understand that. Men will fail you. The more you spend with somebody, the more you realize they're sinners. 
Jesus will never fail you. When we fill our life with godly influences, we're saying, I understand they're limited. I understand they're sinful and I will have mercy on them. And I want to identify and, and I want to help them become more godly. We fill our time with godly people. Uh, when I first got saved, I was working at Volkswagen, Nilo Volkswagen down off of Fulton Avenue. And, and uh, I didn't know anybody else there was saved. I had no clue because everybody acted like they were unsaved. Can anybody else relate to that? I started preaching the gospel. I mean, I was so excited about being saved. I, uh, I would say it, I would just preach it to anybody who came around. In fact, I preached it to the, to the, to the rack that lifted the car up. I just practiced preaching the gospel. I just had so much desire to see people saved. I got called into my boss's office. And he said, you know, you can get fired for evangelizing. And I said, you can get fired for telling me not to. I was a little bit more bold back then. I just didn't know him. And he's like, what, really? And I said, sure. I'm, I'm sure that's a law somewhere. I'm sure. And so he left me alone. And I went out. And uh, the shop foreman at the time, I loved the man to death even before I was saved. And I, 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 had, I still have respect for him. And he came up to me and he said, Kent, let's go to lunch. He took me to lunch. And he said, you know, you need to calm down a little bit. I didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, looking back, there were some things I could have kind of dialed back a little bit, like going to the person and say, you a rotten sinner, you know, you need to get saved. I could have done that a little bit more nicely. Um, but, uh, but he said, you need to calm down a little bit. He said, I'm a Christian too. I said, you are? I had no idea. He said, yeah, I go to this church. And I, I said, wow, I had no clue. I mean, I, there's nothing in your life, I told him, that tells me that you love Jesus. There's nothing. I respect him. I love him. And I, and I want you to understand that we can either fill our lives with people who love Jesus and, and aren't afraid to show it. Or we can fill our pe life with people who say they love Jesus and are afraid to show it. Or we can fill our life with people who obviously don't care or hate Jesus, and it will affect how we, it'll affect what we put in our hearts. It'll affect the spaces of our house. The choice is ours. We, div we started these community groups on purpose because we want a place for people to come to be around people who love Jesus. We want a place for people to come where they can be around people who love God's word. We want a place where people can come, and even though we know we're not perfect, we still have love one toward another. Jesus says this, it's not enough to kick the evil out of your life, to sweep the house and reorganize. You have to fill it with people. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day meaning the time when Jesus comes back. We are more than 2,000 years closer to Jesus coming back than when that, word, that verse was written. He's coming soon. Let's, let's, let's be real with each other. Let's love God. Let's glorify God. Let's live out the gospel Let's help others on the faith way journey. Some of us spend way too much time focusing on removing bad things without replacing it with God. We haven't filled our lives with the good things, with God. It's time to stop. It's time to stop living with empty hearts. And it's time to start living, being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's about time that we remove that which is unsightly in your eyes and replace it with you. Lord, we are here to surrender to you. Lord, we surrender our emptiness. We surrender our clutter. We surrender our chaos. We surrender our addictions. We surrender our, our, our thought processes to you, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Remove them from our hearts. We consciously now acknowledge what is wicked in our lives and we empty ourselves of it and we want to be filled 
by you. Father, we pray that you'd help us as we commit our life to your direction. Father, we pray that as truth is preached and taught and read in our lives, we would accept it, we would ponder it, we would meditate on your word and let it change our lives. Let it fill our house. Lord, I pray that if there's some here today that have never been cleansed by accepting the shed blood of Jesus Christ as their payment for sin, I pray today they would receive the truth that they are incapable of cleaning out their own houses. They are incapable of saving themselves, but salvation is granted and given to them freely if they would just call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, if there are those here today that have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they have been redeemed by faith in Jesus alone, they would now commit themselves to filling their lives with your purpose. Lord, I pray that those of us that have been saved for decades, who have kind of just settled into a place of a place of uh, contentment, that we would, instead of letting things get cluttered in our lives, we would intentionally let you fill it with purpose. Fill it with your presence. Let us be intimate with you so that the end of our days would not be worse than the beginning. So that the end of our days would be better than when we began it. May we love you more now than we ever have before. May we live with purpose. May we live fulfilling your will for our lives. As the wicked is removed from our heart, help us to realize that they're trying to get back in. The devil and his minions want to ruin our lives because they hate you and they hate anyone who is, a, uh, is in alignment with you. May we recognize that. May we identify the chaos they're trying to create, and may we root it out of our lives, but may we fill it with you. With head bowed and eyes closed, we are asking you right now to respond to what God has done in your life. Maybe today he's helped you realize your need to be saved. Maybe you're here today and you realize that you keep trying to cleanse your heart and you keep trying to get the bad things out of your life, the evil out of your life, and you try to, you try to even get uh, the negative evil people in your life away from you. But you keep coming back to the same place. You keep seeing it come back. And you want to see God change your life. And maybe today is the day where you're going to submit and say, God, I cannot clean up my life on my own. I need Jesus to save me. I need to be acceptable in God's eyes. And you have now heard that the only way to be accepted in God's eyes is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Would you do so today? Follower of Jesus Christ, you and I both know that we can try to clean up an area of our lives and we can think that we're doing good only to find out in a couple of days that that same problem is back. That same struggle with sin is right there in front of us. It slipped in and we allowed it to. Would you commit today and say, God, I want to clean it out for you. I want to sleep, sweep the floor of my house. I want to I want to reorganize this room. But I want to fill it with your purpose. I want to be prosperous for you. Would you take the time and just commit that to the Lord? This altar is open. The piano is going to play.